All right, so in terms of the relative size, this pictured right here is a bacterial cell, and these are <coughs> viruses or viral particles. They are not cells. They have no cell membrane, no cytoplasm. They cannot do anything on their own. They exhibit none of the characteristics that living things have, but I will try to clarify them in a moment. So I like to call them viral particles but just to emphasize, they're just like a particle. They're not a cell. So they're very, very small. So what is, a, what is the characteristic of viruses? The, the thing that, uh, as I wrote here, they're not cellular. What are they? They consist of a nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, covered by a protein coating. So they are really, they are really just a couple of molecules. Let me... Uh, if I were just to draw, you know, what a viral particle looks like, and you've got pictures right here, so really all they are is, uh, just draw this, there's an inner core made up of a nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, and then surrounding that is an out, uh, outer covering that is a protein. This outer protein is called a capsid. So you might say, I can't read your writing. Well, I, I, I can't either. It's a C-A-P, capsid, C-A-P-S-I-D. Capsid. It'll be written. We'll see it in a moment here. All right, so uh, now we wrote that the viruses alone cannot exhibit any of the classic characteristics of living organisms. But they have one ability, one thing they can do, they can penetrate uh, 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 a, another cell. So a viral particle can penetrate or enter another cell. They can enter a human cell. They can enter a plant cell. They can even enter bacterial cells. So therefore, viruses act, in a sense, like a parasite. And even though I wrote here that they can multiply inside of another cell, of another organism, Actually, they're not even the ones reproducing or multiplying. It's actually the host cell. It's actually the host cell that actually is making copies of the virus. All right, now, we did write that uh, the uh, viruses are very specific. So the viral viruses or viral particles that can enter human cells generally cannot enter cells of any other species. Similarly, any viruses that enter the cells of dogs can't enter any other cells of any other species other than dogs. Let me give you an example. A cold, we're going to talk about this in a moment, colds are caused by a virus. So if you've got, or, and so is the flu. So let's say you've got a cold or a flu, right? And you're just cold, and you're sneezing. And you're, all right, and you sneeze right in the face of your pet dog or cat. Does your dog or cat come down with a cold? No, because the virus that's causing your cold or, or flu will not enter the cells of a dog or a cat. So they're species specific. They are specific to species, species specific. And there are some viruses that enter human cells. There are viruses that enter dog cells. There are viruses that enter plant cells. Plants can get viruses too. Not only are they species-specific, they are usually tissue cell-specific. You'd say, what? There are viruses that enter skin cells of our body, but will not enter liver cells. There are other viruses that enter liver cells, but won't enter brain cells. There are other viruses that will enter our brain cells, but not enter other cells of our body, our, our liver or skin cells. So they tend to be very tissue specific. So as an example, a virus that can enter skin cells and cause problems causes warts. A virus that enters liver cells and damages liver, the liver, is known as hepatitis B virus, which can damage the liver. Hepato means liver. The virus that enters brain cells can cause the rabies, rabies virus. 
So that it destroys brain cells. So there's species specific and tissue specific. Now having told you that, sometimes that's the general rule, but sometimes they don't follow that. Meaning, occasionally a virus that normally only enters cells of a bird mutates, mutates or changes, and that virus starts to be able to enter human cells. That's what happened with the avian flu virus. Does everybody remember that? Avian flu, it was called avian because it primarily entered and infected and caused disease in birds, chickens and, and other birds. Avian means birds. Similarly, some of you will remember the swine flu virus. The swine flu was a virus that normally caused diseases in pigs, in swine, but it mutated and it started entering human cells. But those are normally the exception. Usually they're species specific. Okay, just a little bit further. One classic question on page uh, H2. Where did viruses come from? They're not alive. All they can do is enter human cells or plant cells or dog cells. But here's the basic answer. We don't know. <laughs> that, that's the answer. But there are a number of hypotheses. Okay, one hypothesis that I wrote is that since viruses resemble the nucleus of a cell, they re may represent the degenerate evolution of cells. Um, that's one hypothesis. Another hypothesis that they used to think was the case, and now they don't generally accept this anymore, is that viruses represented an early stage in the evolution of life that the, uh, before there were cells, there were viruses. But we don't think that that's the cause. Actually, the most con uh, hypothesis that's most accepted at this time is that since each type of virus can only enter or multiply in certain types of host cells, viruses may have originated as genetic fragments from those particular cellular organisms. That, that represents the type of cells that that virus can enter. But the bottom line is viruses exist, they can enter cells, and we don't really know exactly their origin. I mean, the whole concept of the theory of evolution. Nobody knows exactly how life appeared on the planet. Nobody knows exactly how life may or may not have changed over time. All of this is based on hypotheses and theories based upon lines of scientific evidence. But does anybody know for sure? Nobody knows for sure. Okay, uh, viral diseases. Let me just make a few comments here. Uh, the word virus is Latin for poison. Basically, it just enters a cell, and, this, and it results in the cell being damaged by this viral particle entering the cell. The, uh, there are viruses that can enter plant cells, animal cells, and people cells. The very first time they isolated a virus was in the 1930s. That means before the 1930s, they didn't know what viruses existed. How they were able to identify the virus in the 1930s was using an electron microscope. Until they had the electron microscope, there wasn't anything that was powerful enough to allow us to see these very, very minute viral particles. Remember how small they are? Right? They could see bacteria, but they couldn't see a virus until they had an electron microscope. So uh, that, that written, uh, brings up another point. Sometimes, I remember when uh, HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus, the AIDS virus, was first identified. And a lot of people were uh, saying, oh yeah, I think that was created by the US military. Look, because uh, they would say, yeah, we must have created it because they didn't know about it before the 1960s. Let me ask you a question. Do you think we've discovered everything there is to know about the world? So in, in other words, if we discover something in 10 years from now, does that mean that somebody diabolically created it? Or is it possible that we never just knew about it until then? I mean, do you really think we know everything there is to know? Right. So th th we'll be discovering all kinds of things. All right, That doesn't mean it didn't exist before. We just didn't understand it. Um, anyhow, uh, we wrote that viruses can exhibit two types of behavior once they enter the host cell. They're the lytic viruses, which are most viruses. Most viruses are lytic. The word lysis, or lytic, means to break apart. So when they enter a host cell, they cause the host cell to break apart, and, then the, uh, and so the viruses burst out of the cell, destroying the host cell. 
There is another type of virus called a lysogenic virus. Just to give it an easier name, though, instead of calling it lysogenic virus, let's call it by an easier name, non-lytic. The non-lytic viruses, can when they enter a cell, like a human cell, can cause that human cell to become cancerous. So a non-lytic virus, technically a lysogenic, but we'll call it a non-lytic, when it enters a human cell, it causes that human cell to become cancer. You'd say, I never, what? I'll give you an example. Has anybody heard of the human papillomavirus? I'll write it down. Human papillomavirus. The human papillomavirus, commonly abbreviated HPV. So some of you may or may not know that the human papilloma, P-A-P-I-L-O-M-A, the human papillomavirus is, can cause cancer of a woman's cervix of her uterus, cervical cancer. So in fact, they've developed a vaccine now against this virus, so women can get vaccinated against the human papillomavirus. It's called the HPV vaccine. Yeah. It's called Gardasil, but it doesn't cover all. That's a brand name, yeah. yeah um, well, it doesn't cover all because it can mutate the virus. Anything else? No. Yeah. So uh, and so and so you know that it basically it will reduce the risk of cervical cancer if it's caused by this virus. But again, it can mutate, and also cervical cancer can be caused by other, uh, which is a type of cancer, can be caused by other things other than a virus. So, uh, but anyhow, that's an example of a non-lytic virus. Most viruses, though, are lytic; they just cause cells to rupture. Remember, the non-lytic is not causing cells to break apart. It's causing the cell to become cancer. So there's a lot of research going into this. OK, uh, just as I wrap up here for today on this topic, uh, how are viruses transmitted? So uh, the viruses are naturally present in our air, water, and soil. There are viruses all over us. <coughs> Excuse me, I just increased the number of viruses in this room. <laughs> all right? So there are viruses all the time. And so uh, they're, they uh, can be transmitted from one person to another in the following ways. The most common way that they're transmitted is through airborne, through the air. If, uh, if I had a cold virus or a flu virus and I cough or sneeze right in your face and you inhale those viral particles, now they enter your body and they start to enter your cells. And then you'll have a cold virus or a flu virus. So that's what happens with uh, the influenza, which is referred to as the flu, measles, mumps, and chicken pox. So these are commonly found in children. And uh, once one kid uh, gets chicken pox or measles in a school, it's just like wildfire. It spreads everywhere. Right? Anybody have, remember as a kid or have kids where you know, once there's an outbreak of it, they'll send a notice home to your school that chicken pox or somebody has the measles, and it'll just everybody's going to get it. Uh, so uh, another way that it's spread on uh, H3 is, and you'll love this, fecal contamination. And you'd say, oh, what, what? Yes, by coming in contact with feces. It, the virus may be in the feces. And in fact, that's how hepatitis A and polio is transmitted. Well, uh, oh, I don't, without getting overly graphic, let, let me just tell you what's going on. <laughs> Because you might say, like, who's hand what, what's handling, you know, I don't normally walk around, you know, picking up pieces of feces. Um, has anybody worked at a restaurant? Okay, do you work at a restaurant? Waitress or what? We should have hostess or something. Okay, so uh, I used to work as a busboy when I was going to college, all right? So if you worked in a restaurant, now every, the state law requires, there's always bathrooms for the employees. And there's a sign on the bathrooms. State law requires all employees wash their hands with soap and water. Has anybody ever seen that sign? Yes. You've seen it. Does everybody who uses the bathroom wash their hands with soap and water? Not really. Not really. <laughs> Not really means no. <laughs> all right? People go in, they go to the bathroom, and sometimes not only with number one, even number two, they don't wash their hands with soap and water. Well, what if that person is the cook? What if, they're, what if they're the waiter or the waitress serving the salad? 
That's how it happens. Okay, a third way is direct contact, such as with a cold sore. A cold sore, uh, uh, a genital herpes, this is uh, oral herpes and genital herpes. These are herpetic sores caused by a virus. And if you kiss somebody with that virus, that sore, or you have sex with somebody with uh, genital herpes, then you'll have uh, that virus. So that's direct contact. Any questions on that? Uh, now, uh, the uh, number four, transmission across uh, from the placenta to the mother. Any virus that's in the mother's bloodstream will cross the placenta, and the, uh, a new unborn baby will be born with that virus. Uh, with that virus. That's important in terms of German measles, uh, and that can cause birth defects. Uh, transmission by blood. This is hepatitis B and the HIV virus, the AIDS virus, is transmitted through blood. Uh, so people who work in the healthcare field uh, have to be careful in terms of handling blood. Actually, there's many more problems with hepatitis B than there actually is with the AIDS virus, actually, is the truth. Now, all people who work as nurses and in healthcare actually are vaccinated against hepatitis B, because that's pretty common. And a transmission by biting. That's what happens with the rabies virus. But the most common one is airborne through the air. All right, and then uh, the uh, l last comment I'll make, and I'll finish this all up next time. So we've mentioned uh, viruses. Let's just look at one picture, and then uh, we're going to do a lab. Uh, on page H4, on H4, so what diseases do viruses cause on H4? And I'm not asking you to memorize the list. I'm just trying to show you all of these are caused by viral infections, viruses. Colds, the flu or influenza, okay, viral pneumonia. Those are viruses that enter your respiratory system, your lungs. Uh, then there are viruses that enter skin cells. Remember I said they're specific as far as the part of the body they enter. Measles, German measles, chicken pox, smallpox, and warts. All of these cause sores on the skin, right? Anybody ever have chicken pox or something? You get these sores, like an itch, all right? Nowadays, people can get vaccinated, and we'll talk about vaccination next time. Uh, there are viruses that specifically enter and damage uh, brain cells, and viral encephalitis, poliovirus, and rabies virus. There are viruses that enter and destroy and damage the liver, yellow fever virus and uh, viral hepatitis. Uh, mumps virus enters your, actually your salivary gland and causes it to swell up. Anybody ever have mumps? Okay, where it swells up. Uh, herpes is a virus that, of course, we said can get, cause cold sores, fever blisters, and genital herpes. And then we mentioned that the non-lytic viruses can enter cells and cause cancer. Now, if you're thinking, wow. These viruses, then, it should be important to study them and learn more about them because they cause a lot of disease. You're right. This is an area of intense research, virology and the study of viruses. So this is a very important field of research to learn more about how viruses cause these diseases and how they even may lead to cancer. The, uh, so all of you have been vaccinated or immunized. Now, in order for this method to work, you've got to do it before you get the virus. And what they do, what, and, and the, the better word I like is immunize. Does immunize sound like your immune system? And what it does is it enhances your immune system. It makes your immune system stronger. What they do is, uh, is they take the virus that causes people to get sick, whatever that virus is, and they uh, inactivate it. I'm not saying they killed it because it wasn't alive. They inactivate it. Uh, now, remember, what does a virus look like? It's got a nucleic acid core, and it has an outer covering of protein called the protein capsule. And what they do, some of you have learned this in lecture. Uh, you have learned the term in lecture, denaturation of protein. That high temperatures, for example, can cause proteins to unravel, uncoil, and stop working. So can acidity. So imagine we've got these viral particles that cause the flu, the flu virus, uh, or uh, the chicken pox, or whatever it is, and they heat it up. By heating it up, the protein starts to unravel. This is how I depicted it. The protein is denatured. It starts to unravel. That prevents the virus now from entering a cell. And they take this inactivated virus, this inactive virus, 
that can no longer enter your cells and they put it, inject it into your body. So now you've got this virus in, injected into your body. That's what a vaccination or immunization is. And you say, what's that going to do? Your white blood cells encounter it. Your white blood cells see it, as it were, and they start increasing in numbers. Your white blood cells multiply and start producing antibodies against it. Now, it shouldn't cause you, this inactivated virus shouldn't make you sick because it's been inactivated and it can no longer enter your cells. But what it's doing is it's stimulating your, the production of more white blood cells and antibodies against that virus. So now that you've enhanced or stimulated your immune system, now if you're ever exposed to the real virus, now you've got increased numbers of white blood cells and antibodies to destroy that virus. Does everybody follow that? This is called getting vaccinated or immunized. But you got to do it before you get the virus. It's too late once you've got it to enhance your immune response. That's the major, most common approach used to uh, protect us against viruses. So that's why we, we got most, many of us got vaccinated against the swine flu virus. And we talked about last class meeting how they now have a vaccine where you can get vaccinated or immunized against uh, the human papillomavirus. What's the brand name again? Gardasil. Thank you. Gardasil. So, uh, and you can get, in, and what that does is that enhances your immune response, even against this virus that causes a cancer, rather than causing a, a sickness, other types of sickness. Now, on, on each four, uh, so last time we mentioned uh, that viruses cause all kinds of different uh, problems, the colds, flus, pneumonia, measles, Chicken pox, smallpox, anything that ends with pox is a virus. Warts, polio, rabies, mumps, herpes, and even cancer, at least some cancers. Now, they have tried to develop uh, some uh, antiviral drugs. So uh, what they give to people with uh, HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus that causes AIDS, is they'll give them AZT. Uh, and uh, for people with uh, genital herpes, uh, they'll give them uh, a cyclovir. Uh, so some of these are mentioned. I'm not asking you to know the names of these drugs. But basically, none of these cure. They, none of them cure you. Once you've got the virus, it's up to your own immune system. The antiviral drugs will not get rid of that virus. They will maybe make it better, but they won't get rid of it. So if somebody has genital herpes, there is no cure. Now, the good news, no, you don't die from genital herpes, but there's no cure for it. Uh, in the case of the uh, AIDS virus, HIV, uh, that one in most cases people do eventually die from it. So uh, viruses vary in their virulence or how bad they are. Here's the word virulent. So virulent means how, whether they're likely to cause you just to get sick or cause death. 